Hello from my kitchen. Um, thank you to Isabella and the whole Dead Poets reading team for putting together this virtual reading. Um, I'm really excited to be a part of it, even though I'm, you know, bummed that I can't see people in person this weekend. Uh, but we're gonna hang out for like 10 minutes. I'm gonna read some poetry, I've got some, some water, it's gonna be a good time. Um, I'm going to cheat a little bit first and uh, read a poem by a super alive poet, but um, this is my favorite poem of all time and I find that I return to it often in times of uncertainty or fear or change, um, which we are living through right now, so uh, I wanted to share it with you in case you find it useful as well. This poem is called Good Bones and it's by Maggie Smith and I'm gonna read it for you. Good Bones Life is short though I keep this from my children. Life is short and I've shortened mine in a thousand delicious ill-advised ways a thousand deliciously ill-advised ways I'll keep from my children. The world is at least 50% terrible, and that's a conservative estimate, though I keep this from my children. For every bird, there is a stone thrown at a bird. For every loved child, a child broken, bagged, sunk in a lake, life is short, and the world is at least half terrible, and for every kind stranger, there is one who would break you, though I keep this from my children. I am trying to sell them the world. Any decent realtor walking you through a real shithole trips on about good bones. This place could be beautiful, right? You could make this place beautiful. That's Good Bones is by Maggie Smith, who is very alive and super wonderful, and you should check her work out. But um, we're gonna move on to our regularly scheduled programming. So uh, my dead poet is uh, Jason Schinder. I know that's backwards, but um, he was an American poet. He lived from 1955 to, to 2008, and unfortunately he uh, passed away from lymphoma and leukemia at the edge of 52. But he was writing this book, it's called Stupid Hope, um, right up until he died. And then he asked four of his friends to edit and publish it posthumously. Um, and the result is this super raw, like brutally honest snapshot of what it looks like um, trying to come to terms with having a terminal illness. Um, I did pick this book months ago to read, but it definitely feels a lot more relevant now than it did then. Um, yeah, as a writer and, and someone who just like thinks about death a lot in general, uh, this book really moved me. So. I'm excited to share it with you today. Um, it's split into four parts, so I'm going to read a little bit from each of them. Although before we get into the book proper, there's this epigraph at the beginning. It's a Hindu proverb and it says, no disease like hope. So that sort of sets the tone for what we're going to be uh, reading together today. I'm going to start with part one. Middle age. Many of my friends are alone and know too much to be happy, though they still want to dive to the bottom of the green ocean and bring back a gold coin in their hand. A woman I know wakes in the late evening and talks to her late husband, the, widow, the window's blank photographs. On the porch, my brother, hands in pockets, stares at the flowing stream. What's wrong? Nothing. The cows stand in their own slow afternoons. The horses gather wild rose hips in the sun the way I longed for someone long ago. What was it like? The door opening and no one on either side. Living after Stephen Dunn. Just when it seemed my mother couldn't bear one more needle, one more insane orange pill, my sister, in silence, stood at the end of the bed and slowly rubbed her feet, which were scratchy, 
with hard yellow skin and dirt cramped beneath the broken nails, which changed nothing in time, except the way my mother was lost in it for a while, as if with a kind of relief that doesn't relieve. And then, with her eyes closed, my mother said the one or two words the living have for gratefulness, which is a kind of forgetting, with a sense of what it means to be alive long enough to love someone. Thank you, she said. As for me, I didn't care how her voice suddenly seemed low and kind, or what failures and triumphs of the body and spirit brought her to that point, just that it sounded like hope, stupid hope. Eternity. A poem written 3,000 years ago about a man who walks among horses, grazing on a hill under the small stars, comes to life on a page in a book. And the woman reading the poem in the silence between the words in her kitchen, filled with a gold metallic light, finds the experience of living in that moment so clearly described as to make her feel finally known by someone. And every time the poem is read, no matter her situation or her age, this is more or less what happens. Part two, the story. One night while my mother slept, I read a story by Raymond Carver about a man who kept finding his true love but always got the address wrong. To look again was all he could do. Once he offered to trade his shoes for a bus ticket, to ride past the great churches of wood and dust of Indiana, and then he silently undressed himself in a room at the end of a hall, which is a place I know. Only when I go there, love be damned. Get it myself, I say, but that's wrong. I want to be lifted above the walls of myself, but I'm scared I can only be this body that casts one shadow. It can't be the passing of years that kills the man in the story, but it is just off the road. Part three, afterwards. I remember the shame I felt after the news of the illness that I was not as lovable as I thought. I must have done something wrong. And then I was content in my disappointment, which kept me alone. It was a kind of courage that allowed me to go on without comfort. It was a kind of beauty when there was no one I wanted near. Winter. If I could stop hoping for a month, stop praying for a month, I could be alone again with God in the old way, in a room at the end of a hall, and ask why it gets late early now. Coda. And now I know what most deeply connects us after that summer so many years ago. And it isn't poetry, although it is poetry. And it isn't illness, although we have that in common. And it isn't gratitude for every moment, even the terrifying ones, even the physical pain, though we are grateful. And it isn't death, though we are halfway through it. Or even the way you describe the magnificence of being alive with your long blowing hair and reflection in the window pane of the video store. Though it is beautiful, it is. But it is that you're my friend out here on the far reaches of what humans can find out about each other. Part four. The party. And that's how it is. Everyone standing up from the big silence of the table with their glasses of certainty and plates of forgiveness and walking into the purple kitchen. Everyone leaning away from the gas stove Marie blows on at the very edge of the breaking blue orange lunging forward flames to warm another pot of coffee while the dishes pile up in the sink, perfect as a pyramid. 
ah, says Donna, closing her eyes and leaning on Nick's shoulders as he drives the soft blade of a knife through the glittering dark of the leftover chocolate birthday cake. That's it. That's how it is. Everyone's standing around as if just out of the pool, drying off, standing around, that's it. Standing, talking, shuffling back and forth on the deck of the present before the boat slowly pulls away into the future. Because it hurts to say goodbye. To pull your body out of the warm water, to step out of the pocket of safety, clinging to what you knew or what you thought you knew about yourself and others. That's how it is. That's it. Throwing your jacket over your shoulders like a towel and saying goodbye Victoria, goodbye Sophie, goodbye Lily, goodbye sweetie, take care, be well, hang in there, see you soon. And now we've come to the very last poem in the book, actually, um, and by far my favorite. Um, this poem starts with the phrase, if there is no cure, and I've been thinking a lot about that. Um, you know, Shinder was talking about cancer, and uh, uh, it can mean so many other things, you know, COVID-19, or death, or the human condition, you know. If there is no cure for suffering, then what? Then why do we write? Why do we read poetry? <laughs> um, but I love the way that Shinder answers the question. So before I go, thanks again to Dead Poets, uh, the Dead Poets reading series for coordinating this virtual reading. Uh, thanks to all of you for listening. This poem is called Untitled. It's by Jason Schinder. If there is no cure, I still want to correct a few things and think mostly of people and have them all alive. I want a door opening in me that I can enter and feel the clarity of evening and the stars beginning. One after another, I want my mistakes returning and to approach them on a beach like a man for whom there is no division between one way or another. My most faithful body, you are not in the best of shape, far from the glitter of the river in which you once swam. but. I want good tears when I stand on the street and from the sky drifts down the finest mist on my face. Not everything is given and it should not permit sadness. Let me, let me keep on describing things to be sure they happened. Thanks everyone. Take care. <laughs>